The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tommy O'Brien coming to you live from TFNN Thursday morning, just after 9 a.m. Eastern time. We got about 30 minutes to go until the start of trading, and we got markets in positive territory to kick things off. You're looking at an S&P positive by 16 points. But boy, we were higher last night. You were approaching 4,200 in the S&Ps. You make a high at about 3 in the morning Eastern time, about 30 points above where we're at right now. You had the S&Ps up a full percentage point overnight. Right now, you're positive by 4 tenths percent. We got a lot of earnings to go through along with some economic numbers this morning. You got the NASDAQ 100. You're up 74 points, but you were as high as 13,080. You give back about half of the gains overnight. NASDAQ 100 was up more than 1% as well. We're sitting right now up 6 tenths percent. The Dow, a little bit of a lag. Dow right now just under 33,000, barely in the positive. The Russell, positive by nine points. How about crude? $95 and 14 pennies, man. Crude chopping around that $95 price point since the close of action on yesterday. Gold catching a little bit of a bid. This week, we make a low Monday of 1740. It's been higher prices since then. You get the gold contract trading at 1773, and we jump to the all important. Notes and bonds, flat accent action so far in the note and bond market. We get the 10-year right now flat to the tick at 117.08. That's going to correlate to a yield, though, of 3.11%. You talk about a run, man, into some Fed speak tomorrow. Chairman Powell, we start to get some headlines today out of Jackson Hole, though. Uh, we'll see how the markets move on that. The Fed chairman himself speaking tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time, I believe, is the time he'll be speaking tomorrow morning. Uh, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. All right, let's jump around to some of the news we got this morning. We'll kick it off with some fundamental news. It's almost like there's news for either side of the opinion on this one, folks, and every day we get it. The headline out there this morning, key U.S. growth me measures diverge, complicating recession debate. I would say so. So you look at it, GDP contracting 0.6%, better than the prior estimate. Gross domestic income, rising at 1.4% pace, spending revised up. So you look at these two numbers, okay? Gross domestic product is the total value of all goods and services produced in the economy. That's a big one. That's about all that matters, folks, your GDP of your economy, right? Decreased at 0.6%, okay? Annualized rate in April to June period. That reflects an upward revision to the consumer spending and compares to the previous reported 0.9%. Okay, so you get the previous reporting, you get a restatement of that. We're now at a decrease of 0.6% versus a previously reported 0.9% contraction. Okay, and then you have, as Bloomberg puts it, I'd say rightfully so, the lesser known official measure of economic growth known as gross domestic income. That climbed at 1.4% after e increasing 1.8% in the first three months of the year. Okay, so Gross domestic income up 1.8% in the first quarter, up 1.4% in the second quarter. That measures activity by calculating all income generated from producing those goods and services like compensation and company profits. And you say, hold on a second, if we're making more goods, shouldn't what people be making income wise from those goods be somewhat tied to that? Yes, you're correct, it should. Theoretically, GDP and GDI should be roughly equal, but in reality, they tend to differ, especially in early estimates. But the current gap, particularly large. Guess what that does? That means you got something for everybody, man. Um, they suggest there's an abrupt slowdown in economic momentum in the first half of the year. Under the surface, there's more at play, though, including volatile categories, right? Imports, inventories, consumer spending has decelerated, back-to-back -back negative quarters. That's the common rule for a recession. We've heard that one before. GDI, however, gross domestic income, points to more gradual cooling. It paints a picture of an economy supported by a robust labor market and resilient consumer spending, the one that's starting to feel the pinch of the worst inflation in a generation. So interesting, you get both of those numbers out. Uh, choose your data to choose your opinion, folks, on how that goes. Now, we got unemployment benefits out this morning as well. 
decreasing by 2,000 to 243,000. In my opinion, if this thing chops around between 225 and 250,000, it's almost a non-news event. Uh, median estimate was looking for 252, so stronger numbers than what the market was looking for. Continuing claims, which were are one week delayed versus when you look at jobless claims, okay, so continuing claims is for the week ended August 13th, falling to 1.42 million. The decline in jobless claims points to a still robust labor demand as companies try to attract and retain employees amid lingering worker shortages. Not usually the sentiments that you read during a recession, right? Companies trying to attract and retain employees amid lingering worker shortages. Not even close to what you hear. Even so, some employers in the tech sector have been laying off staff or freezing hiring. That's gonna to continue to climb in the coming months as the Fed potentially raises interest rates to curb demand and tame inflation. On an adjusted basis, initial claims declined to about 184,000 last week. You got New Jersey, Indiana, and California having the largest declines. And what about Massachusetts? What's going on in good old hometown, uh, home state Massachusetts, posting an outsized increase uh, for jobless claims. So we get those numbers this morning. And the market takes in stride, but we got a lot of earnings to go over and some some tough numbers to say the least. Why not? We'll kick it off with Peloton, man. Peloton. They are losing Boku bucks, to put it lightly, folks. They get all the acceleration yesterday that they're going to be selling their products on Amazon. And what happens? They give it all back on their numbers this morning. Now, let me cherry pick some of the numbers here. And you don't have to cherry pick hard, man, to find some harsh numbers for Amazon in terms of what they were putting out here. Yeah. So, Peloton has an has an average hardware cost, okay? I'm going to try and find this tweet. Let me see if I can pull it up so you guys can see it. Of $1436 and actually loses $163 on each new subscriber added. All right? Now This is just some of the breakdown. They're everywhere on Twitter. This one did catch my eye, though, folks, okay? Uh, these bikes are shipping from 130 bucks on Amazon, and it costing them $1,436. Brutal quarter. Get that outsourcing going ASAP. Random quote tweet from somebody uh, that I'm not familiar with, okay? Obviously, maybe title, Tide Fall Capital. Not too familiar with Trevor Scott. I don't think he's anybody in particular. Uh, but nonetheless, I believe this is true, okay? They are spending so much money, folks, on every single bike they're making, okay? Now, their business plan is to stop doing that. So eventually, they're going to probably turn that corner, and they're going to get their margins down low enough that they're going to outsource, outsource the production of those bikes. They're probably going to get the margins back into a reasonable level to where they're probably going to be able to actually even be able to afford to cut Amazon in on some of those profits is what you're seeing. But nonetheless, some tough, tough numbers this morning. Uh, and I thought I had it pulled up, but well, maybe not. Let's just jump into it. Big loss and a decline on revenue, and the number is pretty startling, folks. Okay? Peloton's net loss, $1.24 billion, or $3.68 per share. Folks, the stock's only trading at 11 or 12 bucks. Okay? $1.24 billion in three months they just lost. That was 313 million they lost a year earlier. Uh, they, I think it was a 400 million restructuring charge they're dealing with. Some of the losses stem from Peloton's effort to avoid an inventory glut, cut fixed costs, and address other supply chain issues. They embarked on 800 million restructuring plan. Uh, they ended the fourth quarter with inventory of 1.1 billion compared to 937 million a year earlier. Revenue falling 28% to 678 from 936. That came in short of even what the market was looking for, 718. Yeah, tough numbers all around, man, for Peloton. We could spend a whole show just talking about it. 338 million in subscription revenue, up 36%. Okay, that's 56.4% of the total company sales. So that's gonna be a big path for them going forward. Stay tuned, folks. We're coming right back. We'll talk to our man, Kevin Hanks from TD Ameritrade. We'll be right back in three minutes. Vista Gold owns and operates the largest undeveloped gold project in Australia, the Mount Todd Gold Project. Vista Gold just completed their feasibility study, resulting in a 7 million ounce gold reserve. Vista Gold has all major permits approved and has retained CIBC capital market assistance in evaluating alternatives and in completing an accretive transaction. Vista Gold trades on the NYSE American and TSX under the ticker symbol VGZ. 
Vista Gold, executing a strategy to create shareholder value. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything, from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. We've got S&P futures right now in the positive by 18 points, trading at 4160. You got NASDAQ 100 just above 13,000 at 13,014. Let's jump over to our man, Kevin Hinks. Every trading day, folks, 12 noon Eastern time, right here on Tiger TV. Fast Market with your host, Kevin Hinks, Tom White, the team at TD Ameritrade Network. They do an outstanding program, folks. Walk you through the day's market action. They walk you through three trades, three hypothetical trade setups, all of them using options on the Thinkorswim platform, and all of them in defined risk as we come into potentially a very volatile end of the week right now. Kevin Hinks, good morning. Good morning, Tommy. The Jackson Hole Symposium starting out today. We should get a steady flow of headlines and comments coming from policymakers, economists, uh, financial market participants, academics, all those. They'll all be commenting on the current state of the economy, and then it, uh, it, it leads to Jerome Powell speaking Friday morning from there. That, with the PCE data that we're going to get from personal income and outlays on, uh, on Friday, should make for a pretty big end of the week, Tommy. It's pretty cool. We drift upwards, Kevin. I thought we might get a little bit of risk uh, into this market in terms of sitting at a pretty lofty level of 4160 right now in the S&Ps, considering where that recent run higher started of 3600 and change. Uh, we come into potentially some volatility, man, but the market holding up pr pretty well. Uh, even in the face of some of those earnings companies that are out this morning trading a little bit lower. Wanted to get your quick take on Peloton. It's a fan favorite yeah. as in volatility everywhere on that stock, man. Losing more than a billion dollars in a quarter. What was your take on the Peloton numbers as they kind of give back all that exuberance yesterday on the Amazon deal that they put together? I think if you're looking at, at a stock like Peloton, you really got to look to the future, not the present. They're going through some pretty rough times, but this new CEO is really making changes to the company, closing the boutique stores, moving over to Amazon, you know, 
getting more with e-commerce in terms of this company. I think long term, the real question is what kind of how how big will Peloton get? Is it just going to be a boutique company like GoPro and things like that that go crazy when they come out and then settle into a nice level? Um, it'll be interesting. This. this uh, relationship with Amazon is an interesting one. Remember, Amazon, 163 million people view Amazon. So they've lowered the prices of, of, of some of the uh, bikes down to reasonable levels. So for, for, remember, remember, for Peloton, it's all about the subscription services that they can get people to, to, to uh, apply for. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting, but Peloton's a longer story, Tommy. I think you ended it with a great point, as in we all know the the health uh, health industry of items, whether it's uh, I was joking with friends, Kevin, yesterday, um, talking about all they got to do now is get Chuck Norris on the commercials, man, and they'll have the business plan fully intact. Maybe Christine Brinkley or whatever, you know, um, as in they, they've run forever, but what they have, which none of those companies had, are the recurring revenue subscriptions, man. And they get some big numbers there, and we all know it's a turnaround story. And thankfully, if you are an investor in Peloton, that story has already begun with them trying to uh, sub out the production of their bikes, not doing it themselves, because, boy, those numbers this quarter, man, when they're producing bikes themselves, way too expensive at what they're doing right now. We move from there, Kevin. We have uh, NVIDIA moving today, Snowflake with some bang-out numbers, man. They're going to open almost 20% to the upside. What are you guys talking about on Fast Market at 12 today? Three good names that that we'll, we'll be looking at today. Workday, the HR company, the online HR company. Then Ulta Beauty, like Foley will do a presentation on Ulta. And then we'll look at Affirm, the buy now, pay later company, made uh, popular because of Peloton. Tommy, so we'll look at three really good names, all with earnings out today. Man, that Affirm chart, right? You talk about some volatility from 176 when, when buy now, pay later looked like it was going to take over the globe less than a year ago, down to $13 earlier this year, trading at 30 bucks right now. And uh, Alta holding up pretty well this year, one of the better stocks, almost right where you kicked off the year at 412 right now. Bottom of COVID, folks, 124. You came into 2020 at a price level of about 267. So strong performance in Alta. So as we approach, Kevin, as you mentioned, we're going to get plenty of headlines today. What's your basic expectation as we sit, you know, coming into the opening bell? We're up a bit. You're up a little bit more. Do you think we could see volatility today in general? And this is a big opinion. Nobody really knows. Or is it kind of just going to be we're wading through the, the, the analysis we do get for the chairman himself? Or is today something that we might actually see some volatility? I think the anticipation up to Jerome Powell's comments tomorrow are, are pretty clear, right? I think the uh, message from the Fed so far has been pretty hawkish about fighting inflation. But, Tommy, remember the anticipation going into the Fed minutes about the hawkish tone that they expected, and it didn't show up. It was more balanced and more middle of the road, a more two-way discussion about inflation than just pure hawkish. So, you know. The best scenario for the markets, I think, if Jerome Powell puts away the hammer and takes out the feather and <laughs> massages this market back to where it was. So it'll be interesting to see his comments. I'm sure he'll he'll talk tough on inflation, but how does he feel about interest rate changes going forward, Tommy? And then some, uh, you know, I don't have the exact verbiage in my head, but some of what he did talk about there or, or they talked about in the in the Fed minutes was saying that the the effects and the impacts of some of those hikes that they've already given, maybe not felt yet. Um, maybe the market's somewhat receptive to that, that the, the Fed governors kind of receptive to the idea that, you know, it takes time, folks, for these hikes to have an impact. And maybe they're going to allow that impact to play out before they keep hiking um, every single meeting. But guess what? We're going to find out a little bit more within about 24 hours from right now, tomorrow morning, and we'll get some headlines today. Well, Kevin, we appreciate the time you take with us every morning, as always, man. Today should be an interesting one, and we'll be watching at 12 o'clock today, man. Have a great day and have a great weekend, Tommy. You have a great weekend, too. I always say to you on Thursday, Kevin, folks, we talk to Kevin every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right at 9.15 in the morning. Put it on your calendar. So when I say Thursday, it seems, Kevin, there's so much news. I'm going to talk to you on Tuesday. We're going to know a lot more about this market. When I speak to you on Tuesday, man, I can't wait. Have a great day, Tommy. Thanks. You too. Folks, tune in every day. It should be a good one, I'm sure. It's Fed Day. It's Fed Speak, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, along with some great companies they'll be talking about with earnings as well. And yeah, Alta, man. Look at Alta holding up pretty well. You want to be in a uh, 
a strong stock during a recession, I guess you want to be selling makeup, uh, to say the least. Workday, not so much the case, though. Look at that pullback, man. Almost back to the COVID lows for Workday from 307 down to about 140. You've bounced a bit with the market up to 160. Uh, that's a big one. And a firm. Yeah, AFRM. Yeah, that's a tough one, man. Up to 176. Now, I think part of the acceleration this company had, right, was doing deals with Amazon even. I mean, maybe it was the deal that they did in September they were doing that. Uh, not so much the case, folks. Uh, down to 30 bucks. Uh, even this company right now, you jump over to the Analyze tab, you're talking about a $9 billion company at $30. What does that mean? You were trading, what, five, six times that? So we're talking about $45, $50 billion company when you were running up to $160. I mean, thankfully, they're not going to take over the world, folks, because buy now, pay later. For many of the items that they're talking about, yes, they're allowing you to do that, and they're telling you they're not going to charge you fees. But, folks, if you have to, you know, I mean, when this thing was rising to the depths, there were images being posted on Twitter about you could order Domino's with a firm. Are you telling me we're going to start getting to where we're doing buy now, pay later for pizza? But that was literally what they were talking about because they'll service anything, man. As small a price item as you want. Uh, not sure that is good for society as that stock takes off. But right now, sitting at about 30 bucks, that'll be an inter interesting conversation on Fast Market at 12. Check it out, folks. We'll be right back. back for the of booming inflation where your purchasing power is eroded there's no better place to protect your hard-earned money than in gold vista gold's flagship asset is the mount todd gold project in the northern territory of australia this is australia's largest undeveloped gold project we are talking a world-class gold project in a tier one mining district this is a large-scale low-cost project with significant existing infrastructure in a politically safe and friendly mining jurisdiction Vista Gold just completed the Mount Todd Feasibility Study, which resulted in a 7 million ounce gold reserve and a 16 year mine life. All of this combined with the approvals of all major operational as well as environmental permits. This distinguishes Mount Todd as an attractive, de-risk partner, ready development stage gold project. Vista Gold trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol VGZ. TFNN is excited about our new software charting program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts. In collaboration with Tom O'Brien and using his best-selling book, The Art of Timing the Trade, Your Ultimate Trading Mastery System, David White has programmed an outstanding piece of software that will complement any trader's methodology. Using this first-of-its-kind program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts allows you to scan thousands of stocks for Fibonacci formation setups, including Gartley's, ABC's, Butterflies, and much more. The Art of Timing the Trade Charts is designed to help you when scouring the markets for stocks just beginning to form the trading patterns that many investors spend days, weeks, or even months searching to find. And right now, we're offering licenses available at only $79 a month. We are so confident that you're going to love this new charting software that will even give you a 30-day unconditional money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible new piece of software. Get your copy of The Art of Timing the Trade Charts today by visiting TFNN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. For free, each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com.
Welcome back, folks. We've got markets open. You've got an S&P positive, but a little bit of a drop on the open there as we reach levels. Uh, basically, session lows right now. S&P up 12 points. You see the acceleration. We had it about 2 in the morning. You accelerate higher. We give it all back then, plus some. We're just positive by 13 points right now on the S&Ps. You get the NASDAQ 100, positive by 73. Dow actually goes red on the open right now. You jump over to Europe. We get the DAX basically flat. The FTSE up about one-tenth percent. You get the CAC roll basically down two-tenths percent. Over in Asia, positive prices in a big way. The Nikkei up about six-tenths. Shanghai up a full percent. How about the Hang Seng up three percent 6%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng rises after resuming trading. Asia markets rise ahead of Jackson Hole. Uh, but we'll see if they hold as this market gives back some of those gains. I mean, you take a look at the S&P, folks. We're about 40 points off of the highs we had last night. Let's see what that high was. Well, we'll call it 30 points. 30, 35 points off of the highs we got on that acceleration higher at about 2 a.m. Eastern time. We jumped to commodities. Crude. Sitting pretty comfortably above $95 this morning with the gold contract up about 10 bucks as well. Jumping back to Peloton, see how they open this morning. Kevin made some great points, man, talking about, you know, they got some work to do. The story for them might be their recurring revenue and subscriptions going forward. So we'll talk a little bit about that. They're down 14.5%, man. You're losing over a billion dollars in a 90-day period. You better watch out. Uh, they can't take forever to get this turnaround going. That's to say the least. But let's get into some of the numbers they talk about when you talk about subscription revenue. Okay, losses, they're definitely mounting, man. As I said, $1.24 in 90 days. Talk about mismanagement, man. Uh, but this new CEO, he's been in there since February. All right, the company has an $800 million restructuring plan. Now, revenue is down, okay, but connected fitness gross margin got hammered, okay, negative 98.1. They're dealing with some logistics problems, okay, but here it is. They booked 383 million in subscription revenue. This is something that like Nordic Track never did, right? If you had all of these exercise equipment makers that were all over TV in the 90s or 2000s or whatever it is, right? They always had to sell, excuse me, sell the equipment. I mean, if you ever had a back end on that equipment of, of subscription revenue, who knows where Nordic Track might be right now if they had subscription revenue to go with selling the actual equipment, okay? So $383 million in subscription revenue, up 36% from a year. Now, I don't own Peloton, folks. I'm not telling you to buy it right now, but this company is valued at $4 billion. It looks like the CEO is willing to just spend what they have to right now in a short-term period to get things changed, an $800 million restructuring plan. We're seeing a lot of that cost play out right now over the last three months and probably in this quarter we're in right now, okay? Uh, McCarthy's previously been at Netflix and Spotify, made it clear that he's more interested in pursuing growth on the subscription side of Peloton's business. This is something I can believe in, okay? Rather than putting such an emphasis on hardware, he should be, okay? There's nothing special about making exercise equipment for hardware, folks. Nothing at all. It's all been done. It's pretty cyclical. You come and then you go, and then there's a next one that comes beside you, okay? He believes... Peloton's digital app will be core to the company's future. Peloton burned through $412 million in cash in the fourth quarter. Average negative cash flow was $650 million in each of the prior two quarters, so stemming that a bit. It ended June with only $1.25 billion in cash reserves and $500 million in credit facilities. So they got to get their house in order, man, or else they're going to have to go to the public for more money. This is some of the risks that you face if you're going to get in right now, all right? But if you're looking to get into Peloton, say maybe you scale in, right? Maybe if you're looking for a longer term position, you scale in with maybe a 25% position or whatever you take fully, something like that, okay? It ended the last quarter with 2.97 million connected fitness subscriptions, about flat with the prior quarter levels, okay? Not good, not growing there, all right? 2.97 million connected fitness subscriptions, up 27% from a year ago, okay? Connected fitness subscribers are people who own a Peloton product, such as its original bike, and also pay a monthly fee for access to live and on-demand workout classes. Its total member count, though, declined by about 143,000 people from the prior quarter to 6.9 million. Uh, the company hopes to one day amass 100 million members. Now, what I got a little confused in here from, maybe anybody in the Tiger's Den, you could help me out is the, the the difference here between how they categorize connect, uh, connected fitness subscriptions, okay, versus their member count. Obviously, the member count, maybe you're not paying for that in some capacity. 
because it's dipping, but you're at 6.9 million versus 2.9 million connected fitness subscriptions. Nonetheless, if you just focus on this number right here, they got 3 million people paying, okay? They have that number providing, what do we just say? 383 million in subscription revenue, all right? Usually you're gonna be able to get this number with some decent margins, man, okay? That's a big part of it. As in, you're telling subscription revenue on a product that's basically an internet class streamed live. Folks, there's a million YouTube live streams. If you want exercise classes that you can pay for free. The thing that perplexed me most when Peloton went public, folks, now we'll go all the way back to the beginning of their story, okay? I used to see their ads on Bloomberg all the time as somebody that was really into biking, um, just bicycle riding outside. I was always like, that's really interesting, you know? Uh, it's amazing that they can have this type of advertising on a network like Bloomberg that I know is expensive, okay? And that they're just running that type of advertising. What is this company? I look it up, of course. I look it up before they go public. Ah, it's a huge private equity company, okay? Backed by all this private equity. They're gonna go public, okay. So what happens? They go public in September of 2019. The stock opens somewhere around $27 runs up to $37, okay? Now at that time, you're talking about a company, because right now we're at about $4 billion, okay? They've got 337 million shares outstanding. But at that time, you're talking about a company that's pushing 10, $12 billion. And I always said, folks, I can't understand why people are paying $1,500 for an exercise bike, and then you gotta pay like 45 or 50 bucks a month to use it with their classes. That seems absurd, okay? That's more than most gym memberships. Maybe it's not more than most, okay? But it's basically the cost of a gym membership. I think I belong to LA Fitness. I might've canceled it recently. I gotta look in just because I wasn't using it enough. But LA Fitness, uh, some of those have pools. They have saunas. They have, they have entire locker rooms. And I was paying $25 a month. So you're telling me I'm gonna buy an exercise bike and pay $50 a month to use that exercise bike that I just paid $1,500 for? Well, what ended up happening, folks, yeah, that was basically the gist. Things got out of whack during COVID and it all came crashing down when the whole world realized the same thing. Hey, you know, when I was trapped at home, I could justify that type of cost. And if I wanted a Peloton bike, I bought it sometime during COVID. Because if I waited till now, I'm not spending 1500 bucks on it right now to spend that type of recurring revenue. But nonetheless, you know what the company figured out? They probably should be selling the bikes at break even and signing people up for recurring. And I bet that's probably where they're going to, and I bet that's why they want to get on Amazon, folks, because they don't even care about making money for their bikes, because they shouldn't. Because if you can get a long-term subscriber paying a recurring fee at a margin that's gonna be pretty high once they overcome their fixed costs, maybe that's a recipe for success in the future. Nonetheless, not this morning. Peloton gives it back off 14.5% this morning. Uh, just keep it in mind, there is a bull case for Peloton out there. They might have a period of time going forward, another 6, 12, 18 months where they gotta get it under control. Stay tuned, folks. We got markets in positive territory. I'll be right back in three minutes. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. The technology around us is changing every day. With so much happening, it can seem impossible to keep up with all the information. David White's investment newsletter, The Technology Insider, is designed to give you all the information you need to understand the technology that shapes today's markets and tomorrow's future. David White has made his living staying on the cutting edge of technology. His weekly newsletter will give you specific recommendations for value tech stocks, 
as well as entry prices, target prices, and stops to set for each trade. Dave delivers his weekly newsletters every Friday with updates throughout the week. You can get the Technology Insider at TFNN.com for only $37.50. Sign up for David's newsletter, The Technology Insider, and get an inside look at everything the technology sector has to offer. Try it risk-free today with our 30-day money-back guarantee. TFNN, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back, folks. We got the S&P sitting right where we open right now. Positive by nine. NASDAQ 100 in the green. You get the Dow slipping to negative territory a bit. Below 32,900. We jump to crude. Gives back some of those gains under 95 bucks. We jump over to gold. Positive by about $5 on the session. But giving up some of those gains, man. We were almost at 1780 this morning. Gold gives up about $10 in the last hour right now at 1767. And we jump to notes and bonds. You're seeing a little bit of lower price and higher yield. Coming into Fed speak as we approach 3.12%, the yield on the 10 year. All right, let's jump around to some of the other stocks that have earnings going on this morning. We jumped to Snowflake. You talk about some big numbers, man. Up 16.7%. They were at 192 on the open. They give back some of it. Still quite an open for Snowflake. NVIDIA, they were lower. So much for that. They opened basically and pushed a flat. NVIDIA, <clears throat> excuse me, on their numbers, you're flat at about 172 for NVIDIA shares. Uh, we jump over to some of the other companies that have their numbers. As we scroll down the line, where are we at? Here we go. So Dollar Tree and Dollar General, oh, both out with their numbers. Jumping over to those two charts. Dollar Tree gives back 12%. Dollar General gives back 2.3% as they're out with their numbers. What else do we have out this morning? Bunch of companies we got to jump through. Abercrombie and Fitch, you talk about trading lower, man. ANF down 9%. We take a look at this thing, man. Yeah, you talk about some problems. Whew. Look at this run you had, man. From the depths of COVID at seven bucks, we're basically back to where COVID started after spending the better part of last year accelerating to a high of almost $50 for Abercrombie and Fitch. So much for that. You're down 8% this morning on their week numbers. Yeah, and Salesforce I wanted to get to. Uh, cut its full-year guidance. Economic uncertainty slows the pace of customer deals. Better than expected sales and profit for the most recent quarter, but the market's saying, oh, slowing the pace of deals going forward in the next quarter. Economic uncertainty is the catchphrase there. Salesforce down 7.9% on their numbers. Pretty remarkable that you give back everything you had during COVID, man. Down to 115, up to 311. Salesforce back to 165. This is a strong company. Cloud is the future, but you're dealing with some multiples here. Uh, and revising their outlook an investor wants to hear going forward. How about this story out for Boeing? Airplane. Seems like it would be a bullish story for Boeing when they're jets. How about $300,000 a month? Aircraft lessers are reaping the benefits of airplane shortages in past 2019 levels. Leasing firm execs said many of their customers are extending leases with new planes hard to find. The rent on a 737 MAX rising more than 20% between April of 2020 and this July to a solid $316,000 a month. 
That's quite a price tag. But hey, you're getting a 737 Max. You're getting it for the whole month. Uh, you do it per a day. That's only 10 grand a day, man, for a whole 737 Max. But then you got to pay for everything else that comes with it, man. The competing Airbus A320 Neo, $324,000 a month. A version of the A321 Neo, $375 a month. Yeah. Look at these rates, man. All right? So what do we got? We got the black here is the A321 Neo, all right? That's not right back up to where you were, but you look at the other ones in terms of the 737 MAX 8 is in yellow here. You go from 310 to 316, aircraft's in demand. Even what's interesting about this article that caught me the most, right, is you hear airlines decreasing the routes that they're providing, right? So you have aircraft decreasing the number of routes, and what's going to happen there is that that's going to allow them having worker shortages, et cetera, to maybe be servicing those planes they have while allowing them to charge higher costs, right? We've seen some of the airlines come out and say they're actually flying less routes but making a lot more money. Why? Because demand is so high. Well, if that was the case, there should be plenty of airplanes laying around outside of the airlines. Not the case, folks, okay? Not the case at all. Uh, the higher costs come, of course, as inflation's up there. So you're talking about 300000 man, in a big way. Uh, you have one gentleman here who's a chairman of an L.A.-based air lease, said companies' lease extension rate nearing a never-before-seen 90%. It usually runs 65 to 70. A lot of lease extensions on planes that a year ago were projected that would have to remarket. That means the company doesn't have to worry about transition costs at all. They don't have to market anything, man. Everybody just says, give me that plane back. Planes are through the roof. I want a plane. There you go. Um, yeah, look at So passenger traffic rising in 76% in June from a year earlier, but still down about 25, 29% before the pandemic, right? Down, but guess what? Probably a little bit of divergence there when you talk about leasing planes, maybe the well-off doing the most well-off, right? In terms of real estate prices, uh, stock market prices versus where they were all two years ago. If you were leasing a plane in the last year or two, you're probably in a better spot right now than you were a year or two ago considering the price of assets and where they are and if planes are hard to come by why not man scoop up the plane for another year lease we jump over to boeing shares this morning and they're up about 1.3 percent so this one's an interesting one with boeing man if you're looking for some action on boeing and you're back within this channel you do want to break out of this channel to the upside eventually this is pushing a year and a half folks you break out of that channel to the downside we get back in it just recently and at the end of last month um, maybe we come down and touch the bottom portion of that at some point. We were just trading at 157. That earlier this week? Yes, it sure is. 157 on Monday. And just like that, Boeing's up to 166, catching a little bit of a bid this morning with the market. Let's jump over to some of the airlines. Yeah, we get the airlines trading higher as well. Delta's up about 1.5% right now. United up about 1.5%. Uh, American, similar, about 2%. We jumped domestically. JetBlue up 1.3%. Southwest right now up about 1.6%. Let's see how the cruise ships are doing. Carnival up about 4%. We take a look at this thing. And yeah, you know, I... Here, watch this. I want to see something crazy, folks. This downtrend channel that it's been in for the last couple of years, almost an extension of its highs of 2018. You take the COVID acceleration out of there, and this thing has basically been in a downtrend from $72 sitting at 10 bucks right now. That's a monthly... Okay, we just put this thing back on a five year daily and we just zoom in on where this recent trend started accelerating. And yeah, you know, maybe this is your point. You just trade this thing for a bounce to the upside, man. Carnival, you know, you're talking about a stock that could trade as high as 16, 17 bucks if you just trade to the upside of this channel line. And again, folks, it's an art, not a science. Where's the where's the top portion of this channel line? Right. Could you make the case that maybe it's a little bit lower, maybe a little bit of linear regression matching those up? Maybe that's where it is. Nonetheless. You got quite a large channel. You could trade to the upside. The thing I'll say is they got so much debt right now, folks. The thing that you're doing is you're taking a risk, okay, because they have so much debt that unless things really start turning back on in all cylinders, if they face any type of interruption that they're not foreseeing right now, some great articles have been written just saying, listen, if there's ever any type of COVID flare, and I don't see that coming, okay, um, but you never know, folks, as we all found out two and a half years ago, but even more probably more probable would just be an economic turndown that maybe retirees are a little bit more worried about their nest egg. Maybe they're not cruising like the level that they thought they were. You could see this company go BK. So be careful if you're getting into that equity. 
but maybe this is the area. As you break back within that channel line, Carnival's up 3.8% today. We jump over to a Norwegian, up about 3.4%. Uh, different story there. You probably got a downtrend in similar category on this trend since about the high of June of 2021 as well. But the market's holding up relatively well so far. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of Fed speak when we get back here as Kansas City's Fed's George says it has to get rates higher to slow down demand. Speaking on Bloomberg TV this morning, already the headlines starting to come out. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Dan at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the Opening Call newsletter at TFNN.com. The Opening Call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. We catch a little bit of lift. The volatility begins right now. Not sure what just got said. Maybe it was something, or maybe it was nothing, or maybe it's just people buying right now. But we got all the markets back in the green with the S&Ps up 21, NASDAQ 100, Europe 80. You get the Dow up 40, Russell right now up 16. Crude sitting right at 95 bucks this morning. We've got gold up $6, and we jump to notes and bonds. Pretty tame action so far to kick things off with the tenure sitting at about 3.1 percent so we'll kick it off with some of the headlines one of the headlines at least that we get from esther george kansas city fed she's talking about has to get rates higher to slow down demand uh and may have to take them above four percent for a time they said that's what she says it's very important that we're clear in our communication about the destination we are headed 
This is um, from Jackson Hole this morning. We have to get interest rates higher to slow down demand and bring inflation back to our target. Seems pretty reasonable. That's what everybody's saying, okay? Asked how high the Fed should raise rates. There was more room to go, is the quote, and push back against bets in financial markets. The central bank will begin cutting rates next year. Folks, if you see the market start to reprice the probability of cuts coming next year, and I don't see that happening, at least not yet. We'll see what Chairman Powell has to say tomorrow. That would be a game changer. I think we will have to hold. It could be over 4%. I don't think that's out of the question. You won't know that, I think, until you begin to watch the data signs. Uh, very true in that we don't know what's going to happen, folks, until it plays out. That's why some of the optimism may be a little bit misplaced with the market trading near 4,200 when we got a last CPI print at 8.5. Is it theoretical? that what the Fed is doing right now tames the inflation that we're seeing? Of course it is. Does the data back that up yet? Not even close. So we'll see where we go from there. Uh, but we got a Fed meeting that begins September 20th, 21st. Ahead of that, right, we're going to come back from the long weekend, uh, Labor Day. And what's going to happen, folks? We're going to be two weeks out from a Fed meeting. We're going to start getting jobs numbers. We're going to start getting CPI numbers, and it's all going to matter. But before we do that, we get some Fed speak today. It should be an interesting one, folks. Stay tuned. We got our man Basil Chapman. He is coming up next, folks. Then we got our man Steve Rhodes at 11, Fast Market at 12, Larry at 1, Dave White at 2, and our man Larry Pesimento filling in again today for my dad live at 3 o'clock. Don't miss it, folks. Live